Ladies and gentlemen, you have a real treat coming up because the absolutely amazing Andy Kaufman, Francie Rawlings, Laszlo Gonk, Maria Mattarell, and Jennifer Tharp. You have to be able to see the big picture. You have to have kind of a systems mindset. We often don't think of those people. Like, who are those people that are going to impact us? You have to do something different than, than the average person if you want to be a leader, right? And Ladies and gentlemen, Alan McKellar is not just a really terrific friend. He is also someone who has invested a great deal of his intellectual and emotional property into what it means to be responsible for the welfare of the people on his team. And his teams have ranged from Procter and Gamble to we met when he was working with CA. And then he's taken this great big dive and is back to pure product development and smaller companies where his impact is probably even greater. More than that, I'm proud to say that my friend Alan is also a Stutch family man. Alan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Kimi. I appreciate it. So your perspective on leadership is one that is a little bit of homegrown and a little bit of academic and a little bit of research and learning that you have gained. So what do you think that of all of those things, what do you think you learned about leadership that you could never have gotten from a book? Oh, it's a fantastic question. Um, I mean, for me, the first thing was that it's one thing to read about pressure and how to handle it. It's another thing to really experience it in the moment and then being able to handle it well um, and, and do it in a way that serves both yourself and your team and your colleagues. And that leads me to the second point that, it, you know, again, you can read about having allies at work and building coalitions and you know, gaining alignment, it's another thing to actually do it. And when done well, it really, again, serves you, but it serves your colleagues and it serves your teams. Okay. I think that people often think, if I just read all the right books, I will learn how to be an amazing leader. And that hasn't been my experience. So I'm delighted to hear that you've also seen some practicality. Now, one of the things that you and I share is an extreme distaste for a particular phrase. <laughs> what is it about the word resources? Yeah, I, yeah, I, especially in the domain we grew up in in project management, uh, we heard a lot about scope schedule resource and you know managing the iron triangle really well. And so I like to differentiate between stuff and things like tools that we're using to manage projects and people. Um, I learned a long time ago from a mentor, it was a VP at Procter & Gamble that I reported into that the people that create and maintained intellectual property that basically drive your business are the most important asset. And they're not easily bought. You can go out and go to a store, you can go online, you can buy project, you could buy AHA, you could buy Basecamp. You can't buy the people that are actually <laughs> using those tools and know how to configure them really well, right? Um, and then finding the right people that have your value set and are committed to doing work um, is key. And what I have found over my time is that projects will go south, not because of the technologies, but the interface between peoples and teams. And so spending time polishing those interfaces, making sure expectations are clear and showing people how their contribution matters and how the team's contribution matters has much more impact. So I, I really hate the word resource when we really mean people. Yeah, we, we really do. I tell people all the time, look, HR stands both for human resource and for hardware. So instead of calling them resources, why don't we call them 
humans and hardware. Absolutely. So you spoke to the interfaces in between teams and what is your opinion ha about the level of interdependence between projects and project teams now as compared to say 10 years ago? Oh, I think it's really, really critical. More so than it ever has been. Um, it's a team effort now to have a business differentiate itself from all the other offerings that are out there. And you don't have the time to treat the work in series. So R&D can build a product and then I can figure out the value proposition and then get a marketing message out, hand that off to marketing, who then in turn does that plans it out for a launch for next quarter, then hands off the sales to say, hey, this is it all in the, you know, the offering that you can make to customers. Now the expectation is much more dynamic in real time where, you know, what do you have to offer right now? Mm -hmm. And having that coordination amongst your coalition that this is what we are going to push to help our customers be successful, I think is key. And you know, I think at some level, a lot of us in product development and account management had that at the back of our minds, you know, that mm -hmm. our job ultimately was to give our clients a, a tool or capacity or um, just an understanding that would help them be more successful. But I don't think it was articulated as clearly as you just did. And it was never really brought front of mind. This is really what we're supposed to be doing. Um, when you look at all of the things that drive a successful business, even when they have articulated that they understand that their mission is to help their customers be more successful. And they have articulated that they value and demonstrate that they value the people who have made that possible. Um, how does that affect the fact that we're each, each of us, we're, we're whole people. We don't walk in the door and you don't walk in the door and say, hi, um, this is Alan, the vice president of product development, and I'm going to put the hat for the parent of some amazing kids, you know, or the partner. And, and I'm sure Amy appreciates that you would never take that part, that hat off. Right. But you, you can't do that. You can't just parcel out parts of your personality. So it's been my experience that you've been particularly good at handling the integration of being involved with your family and being part of the larger community, whether it's the professional community or the, you know, where you live kind of community. And at the same time, keeping your focus and your eye on what's going on for you as a professional in the business that you're in at the time. How in the heck do you do that? Well, that's very kind of you to say. Um, I think Amy might disagree with you a little bit, <laughs> but you know, it, it takes work. It takes work to have that focus and to say that this is who I am. I'm gonna bring my best self to work and I'm gonna allow others to do that as well. And as you point out, we're very complex people that have all these different facets. And so for the period that we're at work, let's be engaged and involved at that point. And then we give ourselves permission and our colleagues permission to shut that off and go and do what we want to do with people we love. Because we need that nourishment and we actually need to clear our heads. Studies show that we're always dealing with these problems. So when we deal with the problems in detail, then we need to take a break and let the subconscious work it, right? And sometimes some of the best creative answers come through working that. And then we shift over to our other priorities that we have in life and, uh, and make sure we, we deal with it. I think there's a false economy that people want to believe because it's easy. If, if I just work 20 hours a day, I, I will get everything I need, right? If, if I push, 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 we'll get what we need. 
And I think the question really is, are we being thoughtful as a business and as an individual? What is it that we want to go after? So often you and I have seen throughout our careers, uh, Kimi, people want to do a lot of busy work. They want, they want to be busy. That's okay. But is it moving us forward? Right? If, if it's moving us forward, that's okay to be precise. If, if we're just doing stuff to do stuff, it may not be okay. How are we tracking that to ensure that it's aligning to our final objective in terms of our customer and client? Are we mm -hmm. meeting their needs? So um, I think it's just being focused. And when I'm dealing with a customer, being engaged with them, or if I'm talking with a colleague, being engaged with them, um, when I'm with an employee, am I engaged with them? And um, some of the best people I've worked with are folks that I use to debias myself and make sure I'm staying true to myself. And they are perfectly okay to tell me like, hey, guy, listen to me. I don't think you're listening. And I go, oh, you're right. Let me put the phone down, right? Or that <laughs> other distraction from being fully engaged. Um, even little things like you're in a meeting, how many of us have got our laptop open and we think I can be engaged with you in this discussion right now, Kimi, and I could just take care of updating a task here, there, and project. Right? It is, yeah, it is one of the most interesting dilemmas that I run into that despite the fact that some of the top neurologists and sociologists in the world have been wandering around going, you can't multitask, you can't multitask. It's physically impossible. Your brain can't do it. Nobody is willing to stop and believe it. And I find it amazing because I fall into that trap myself. And Michael is one of those serial monotaskers. He will have five things on his list to do for the day. And he will literally go from one to two to three to four to five. I will have 25 things on my list to do, and I'll probably get half of five of them done. Five of them done enough and two things done up to my own standards of excellence. And I know that you can't multitask. I know this, um, but you're right. It's it's kind of a trap. Um, but why is that? Is, oh, well, that was going to be my next question. Who do you think is responsible for encouraging the level of pressure that so many people feel to multitask? Where is that pressure coming from? Oh, I think that pressure comes from a lot of different places, starting with yourself, right? I mean, you're, you're a high achiever, high performer. You want to get a lot done. You want to get a lot done for your clients. Uh, what the work you do is extremely important to them, right? It's strategy. They, they want to know what is the unlock that will take our business to the next level. So um, you put a lot of pressure on yourself. That, well, how do I meet this need for my client? Um, and then there's also pressure outside where, you know, we see movies or we talk with friends and you see on social media, people talk about, I, I, I'm doing my best life professionally. I've done all this stuff. Look at this. I'm taking care of my family. And, and, you know, if, if you go and, and you talk to people offline uh, with colleagues, you find out it's not all roses, right? There, there are some challenges to doing that. Um, I'll say this, Michael's doing better than me. I only try and do one good thing a day. That's all I'm, that's all I'm shooting for. You know, what is that one customer I'm helping today? What is that one key employee I'm helping today? Um, how am I driving the business forward? So I think Michael's doing amazing work if he's doing five. <laughs> I'm, I'm not getting very close to that. And I know you, you're doing They're a not lot. very big things, okay? He's very focused on very specific little things like, I'm going to crack the programming for the water um, for the water system that we've got set up inside the house for our plants. And he did, he's not happy with the timing because it's off by 45 seconds from where he thought he designed it to. 
So he'll say, okay, today I will fix that. You know, so they're very discreet tasks. And I think that may be one of the things that you and I are finding is that we need to be very clear. And this was something that you had made a big mention of, is that being clear on the requirements, what it is, you know, clearly defining what it is you're trying to accomplish to begin with can be so much of a help in actually succeeding in doing. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And I think for me, one of the big lessons I had out of a recent uh, government project I did a few years ago with the team is I would add today, not just understand the requirements, but the intent, right? Because on that particular project, it was the third attempt to modernize a very large $4 billion system it was on a mainframe going back to the mid 70s and the first two attempts now there's a lot of lessons to be had from this <laughs> exercise but um you know they had the two failures amounted to an estimated 40 million dollars in taxpayer money right and several years of effort what they tried to do was to digest two 700 page documents on requirements and so the approach initially was, let me document all the requirements that the system has to do, and let's build the system for that. And in fact, the very first contractor was the one that ran the mainframe system. So it was believed that they had the highest probability of success. But why do you think those approaches didn't work? Where do I begin? Well, I'll point out two, two examples. Um, one is that the requirements were limited to what people understood the technology could support. So you fast forward 50 years later, right? Technology has changed. And what this team I was working with had done is said, hey, we don't actually have to do things in batches anymore. We can do things in what's called near real time because there's this thing called the internet that allows us to pass data back and forth. And people had the system, the technology so ingrained in their understanding. They said, no, 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 no. We have to do accruals and updates. And, and we say, well, no, you do that because there was an error or a timing issue. But literally you're gonna put in the transaction and not even seconds, it's updated. You will have to have an exception for the process just in case, yes. But we, you don't need to treat, you don't need to run batch files every night anymore. You could do it in real time. So the first thing was the technology was so ingrained, people limited themselves because of those requirements. Um, the, the second thing was it didn't, and I know you're a big fan of this and you know this, it didn't represent what the customer wanted. It represented what the system was doing, right? Or thought to be capable of. Yes, yes, exactly. And so what this team had done very wisely was we just went out and we spoke to all the users in the field. So people that would actually put you know, data into the system, we talked to partners that need to pull the data out to do their part of the workflow. Um, we then had to do, because it was the government, the federal government, we had to show them that we were meeting their requirements. We would map several requirements out of their two requirements documents to a feature that we had built. So we would say that we're building feature A and the following, literally, it would come up like a dozen or 18 things are met because of the way we're doing this. And I, I will give the agency a lot of credit. They gave us a lot of flexibility. And once they started to see momentum shift and it was positive, they were flexible enough and intelligent enough to say, all right, well, let's see where this goes, right? And we did demos and all the standard things you would think about to show people progress. And we got the system online a year early. So, so it's not just about the requirements, but understand the intent from the customer viewpoint. Especially since when we look at technical requirement documents, 
sometimes they're way too focused on how something is going to be accomplished and may not ever state explicitly what it's actually going to accomplish. Yes. And so what is what do you think the value is of just keeping in mind a going back to the basics kind of attitude? Because let's face it, almost everybody has at some point or another had a system or an application or a tool shoved down their throat by the organization they work for. And as far as they can see, it doesn't actually help. So you and I have always discussed, okay, why aren't people talking to the end users? And that is for us a fundamental principle of building anything is understanding how people expect to be able to use it. Why do we, one, why do we forget about the basics? And two, how do we get back to a point where we remind ourselves, okay, there are some basic principles of well done product development. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Uh, one is, I think, one of the causes for us to skip that important step to talk with the customer is the pressure we feel to get something done in a certain time frame. And in my experience, most of the time that's arbitrary. If you go back to a customer, well, sometimes it isn't, right? Sometimes there's a market window that marketing says, I got a hit because we've got a conference and, and there's some healthy tension right. between marketing, sales, product, and engineering, right? To figure out what we can build and what time frame. But um, let's say you were going to change the CRM in your company. That's a huge lift. And you start to meet with stakeholders. And every stakeholder group's got a different report or dashboard that they want run. Oh, you're laughing because of knowing. I can tell, right? And did you? Yeah, yeah. The scars are there for you and I, right? And you got all these different stakeholders and and we treat all of the requirements the same as if they have the same weight. And then what what do the inexperienced people do? I think they get frustrated by not taking care of the stakeholder management piece well. The executives apply pressure like, hey, we're spending a lot of investment here to get this done. Where is it? And then you shove it out the door and you get it done. You claim victory. And then the adoption isn't there that you wanted, where the efficiency that you wanted isn't there. And so one thing is making sure we're setting realistic expectations on timeline with executives and other stakeholders, creating the metrics that we agree to in advance to show the team where we're heading, having a culture of constant learning where people are open to feedback and saying, hey, this isn't working that well based on the metrics that we identified in advance. This is not tracking the plan. And then, you know, let's have the courage to make that change. And so if you lay out these other steps in advance, like setting the expectations and having the metrics, it's easier to say to the various stakeholders, look, we intended to do this, but here's this challenge. We're going to go back and analyze it, but we think the recommendation is to do this and move forward. Um, too often, people think that they just got to get something done. And the question is really how to do it well. Like Michael in the example, he had a, a design and it's not meeting his design requirement. There's a reason why he had a requirement around response time. Mm -hmm. And as a craftsperson, he's going to go back and he's going to address it because he cares. And, and again, under time pressure, we've gotten away from saying, do we care about our craft? Whether it's project management, leading, strategy development, in your case, we... Engineering. Engineering, yes. <laughs> and, and I think sometimes we're, we're too smart for our own good, right? We, we get into the details of things. We start to, to go down really hard. I, I had this earlier this week with some of the I work with. And he has tremendous energy, is very intelligent. Wanted to do all these things. And I said, well, is that the plan for Q4? Huh? You know, we met 
we did a kickoff meeting on what we were doing for Q4. And I just simply asked, is this in plan for Q4? Is this the focus for our business? And again, if you've done the other fundamentals right, you have mm -hmm. mechanisms and processes you can call on to reorient people. And if we have, you know, people don't like to say this because you don't, nobody likes a meeting, I think. But a productive meeting people will attend and go to. If we have checkpoints mm -hmm. to revisit progress based on the metrics we have, and we can make the adjustment and move on. I think that um, oftentimes the, and actually you reminded me, we met after I did my speech on the tyranny of the urgent, making such a big impact on people that they were, in, they were voluntarily giving up the benefit of solid planning, back to basics and critical thinking. And one thing that I'm I'm struck by is that it doesn't take a huge psychological delve into somebody's thinking or something. Just ask the simple question that refers back to the clearly defined metrics and give them an opportunity to rethink it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you were to if you were to go back in time, you could be you. And we're going to do an odd sort of quantum leap thing. You're you now, and you get to meet you 15 years ago. What three bits of advice would you give Alan from then? Wow. Three bits of advice to give myself, my younger self. Yeah. You know, the. I think the first thing is, you don't have to have all the answers. <laughs> There's, when I, it, early in my career, I thought, and some of the people I reported into emphasized the need to know everything. And the reality is we can't know everything. Um, we can know a lot about a particular domain or vertical. We can know a little bit about lots of things. Right. Um, and that's the, the benefit of diversity, having a lot of other people around you, some specialized, some not, some that help de-bias you and ask questions of, of what's going on and give you a contrarian view. So uh, when I first became a director of engineering, somebody gave me an opportunity to do that. I was I had been in this role for just a few weeks and they had a quarterly business review and they had invited 100 people from New York City to visit our team and just view how we were doing planning. And the other three directors that were there were very comfortable. They had been there at least a year, if not longer, but more importantly, they had worked with the general manager over a period of years. I had never worked with this general manager before. And I was amazed as I listened to the other three directors, people would fire off answers and they would immediately respond with things. I was like, wow. I was struck with the command they seem to have of their domain. And we each had a template slide that we were supposed to present from. And we all had 45 minutes to do our, our section of it. Um, everybody ran over. Uh, so it was seven o'clock at night and I was presenting. And I had decided that there was very little value in me going through each of the 22 slides as everybody else was. I felt that there were three important things I wanted to raise with the group. Some, hey, th these are really positive items and given my newness to the organization, an item that I wanted to improve upon. And I went through it, took me about 10 minutes. Uh, there were a couple of questions I couldn't answer. And so my second point to my younger self would be, it's okay to keep quiet. So too often we think that we, we have to fill the void. Silence has a pressure all its own. And if a meeting's dead quiet, people, right? And it was hard. I remember initially just counting seconds off my watch. Like 10 seconds feels like an eternity when you feel there's 200 eyeballs on you. But 
frankly, I didn't have any choice, Kimi. I didn't know the answer to some of these questions. And, you know, product manager on my team stood up and said, well, you know, we could do this, this, or this. Here's three options. And people were like, oh, okay, that's good. And I sat back and I thanked that individual and asked for another question. There's another question. The lead engineer on my team said, after a few moments of silence, well, you know, we could do this. We could maybe just do an integration through an iframe here, or we could do that. All right. Well, I appreciate that comment. Did that answer your question? They said, okay, great. And so um, don't, don't respond to the pressure of silence. Use it to your advantage. And uh, I think that it showed that I was a much more confident leader. I didn't have to know all the answers, but I knew where to go to get the answer if needed, right? So that would be my second big point. And my third big point to myself would be just always be learning. And especially in light of being quiet. How often have we worked with executives, Kimi, where they will ask the question and then lead the witness by saying, because of this, this, and this, you're using this technology, right? And then the person on the other side is forced to say, uh, yeah, sure, right? They feel that pressure because we bias them in some way. Instead of just putting the question out there and leaving it and let it sit and letting that other person collect their thoughts and provide the response and then provide the next level question, maybe the five whys, right? To figure out what's really going on here. But yeah, I, I think for me, it's about just listening, using quiet, really learning. There is uh, a guideline going around these days for people who do a lot of work over internet meeting places and they say very urgently oh you should never let more than seven to ten minutes go before you get interaction from folks and change their physicality or ask them to respond to a question and one of the lead facilitators in giving the certification said i want everybody to be very quiet for seven seconds. And you could actually hear, so that leave your mic on. And you could hear people shifting in their seats and getting uncomfortable. And, and on camera, I actually saw a couple of my colleagues go, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but the funny thing is, it wasn't all that long to the person who was timing us. And if you just even counted your heartbeats, I've had people sit in a room and not say anything while they digest the question so that they can actually answer it fully. And I will grant 25 seconds feels like an eternity. And yet I know that it's an investment. I'm going to get a much better answer because they've thought about the question. Well, that, I think the way you view it is brilliant, that you view it as an investment. And you'll get a higher return if you allow that investment to take root. It's tough, but sometimes it's definitely worth it. I love the term, if you don't mind if I go back a little bit, you use a term called unbias as a, as a verb, you know, to unbias me. And how do you build such a level of trust? Because you're not exactly Joe Blow, you know, peer. You're, you're usually in a leadership capacity, if not an executive leadership capacity. So what do you do that gives people permission to say, hey, What do, what do I do? Um, well, one, I very deliberately look for that. I look for people that are respectful, right? You don't want a heckler. They're just, just hassling you and what you're trying to do. But you do, you do want people that are truly your ally that will pull you aside and say, I don't, I don't see how this is going to meet our requirements 
or meet our objective? Can you help me understand why you're saying this or doing this? Um, and when people do that publicly and respectfully, being cognizant of your response and going, wow, I didn't think about that. You're right. Let me, let me revisit it. And um, that, that does take time, right, to build. Uh, I remember years ago, I met at HP Labs. I was working on a project. And I told the program manager for documentation, I said, you are so important. You are so important to us. Thank you for coming to the kickoff meeting. And she very respectfully said, oh, glad to be here. And I didn't find out until literally three and a half years later, she thought I was lying the whole time because she had such bad experiences with other project managers in the past. It took about a year for me to build, you know, just over and over and over again, doing what I said I was going to do. So often in that space, what would happen is if you didn't ship a product on time, what an engineering team might do is say, well, the documentation was holding us up. And she just had this really, you know, bad allergic reaction to that. And my approach had always been, one, she didn't understand I came out of IT service delivery where I read documentation. So I had a very different view of the value of documentation. And then two, I, I did mean what I said. And so it was a question of how do we help get information to docs so they could do their job? Or how do we communicate we're behind on something? Maybe we don't know how to implement a feature fully, or we went to a beta and a customer's like, this isn't working for us, and we need to change it, and we need to revisit. And, you know, working with this individual, we found ways where we'd communicate updates, and it made them even more responsive to us because they felt like we were treating them as I thought we should a true partner. So I think it's doing it by example and then uh, rewarding people for bringing stuff up and then, you know, correcting the trajectory based on that. Um, you know, the worst thing you can do, I think, is to, was it shoot the messenger, is to colloquialism, right? You know, yeah, you know, have, you know, listen to the feedback. Hopefully most of the time people are saying, I need here's my proposal on, on a plan, but sometimes people are going to say, I don't know. And that's okay too, right? I mean, you don't want it to be too frequent. And a, a recent example for me is earlier this year in the role that I'm in now, uh, I was being asked to present on the technical aspects of a modern AI conversational product with venture capitalists. Second weekend. No pressure. But, no pressure. And I, I went to my CEO and said, I'm, a, I'm out of my depth. I don't know what to do. I really didn't know what to do, Kimi. And to his credit, he brought in the head of the board. So you can imagine the pressure, right? They've hired me to do something. And now in the, you know, day 14, <laughs> job, he's saying, I don't know if I could do this for you. But I was, I, I was experienced enough and confident enough that I understood it was going to not go well, or at least not meet my high standard if I wasn't prepared. And sitting with the head of the board and the CEO, we we built out a template of how I was going to handle the meeting because the VC had not provided an agenda. It was very open-ended. And I was very well prepared by Monday to give that presentation. And obviously, as I did more of them with other investors, I got better and better. But you have to show a little bit of humility, I think, and show a little bit of vulnerability and be consistent with people and, and keep your word about what you're, you're going to say you're going to do. And sometimes that's hard because we all have a lot of things going on and we all feel pressure to be very intelligent and to have the answers. But um, I, I know enough about myself that I need colleagues around me that are willing to point out things because I want us to win. And so one way I remember to keep my focus and my openness to not fall victim of my biases and preconceptions is to say, I need systems and processes in place that revisit metrics, periodic meetings for review, the gates, but also people that 
when those systems, they can't plug every hole in my understanding, people that, because they want to do the right thing by the business and by me and by our clients will say, Hey, you know, I think I see a challenge here or better yet. Hey, this is going great. Keep that up. Right. Mm -hmm. And all too often we forget to boost each other up and say, Kimi, you did a great job with that today. Thank you. And let's, let's learn about from that. You know, a lot of times we talk about in a negative context, all the lessons learned because of these problems. A lot of times we can reinforce what we learn on all the good things. Let's keep doing that and this because it helps us move the business forward. So yeah, I, I give people permission. I show them. I, I wish I could tell you I'm perfect, far from it. And, um, but people have always been very good to me to say, Hey, but he's made the adjustment or he's learned, um, you know, based on new information, new data. And that's how I try and stay on track. You're probably more consistently good at that than a lot of people that I know, which is why I wanted, I was imposing upon you to answer that question. We do talk a lot about diversity and inclusion, and sometimes it runs into a single word, diversity and inclusion. And you will have, you will always have a fair, a certain level of diversity in the teams and the organizations around you because of the various levels of diversity, whether it's schooling or upbringing or generational things or frankly, geographic. I went through a little bit of culture shock when I moved from the West Coast to the Midwest. I, it's five years. I think I'm still going through it. Um, but without that trust level, establishing that trust and making sure that it's a, a trust account that you're mutually building and investing in. You've got the diversity, but not the inclusion because there, there is a less of a sense of safety. And, um, and you've probably read it, the Aristotle project at Google about teams. And they thought all these things were going to make their team. These were the things that made our team so high performing. And it turned out to be very, very simply one thing. One thing that was really tough, but it was psychological safety. It was not whether or not they shared this interest or that interest, whether or not they were you know, physically close together or of the same generation or you name it, they, they tried everything and it turned out to be psychological safety. Yeah. And so yeah. that level of trust that you build, I think is one of the ways that you create an environment of psychological safety. So. Um, That's very kind of you to say, I, you know, I, I joke around with people when I'm working with them and, you know, things I detect get a little too tense and I'll say to engineers, especially in this domain, it happens all too often, unfortunately, I'll say, we don't get paid to sweat people. Just relax, take a deep breath. We're going to be okay. So let's, let's break down to the first thing we're going to do and we'll do that and showing people a path to life, right? It's showing them how these different blocks build on each other building momentum in a positive way. And uh, and it takes time to build all that. I was in a difficult situation the other year at the previous startup I was at. We had a data pipeline go down on Friday and it was gonna impact marketing and a very important client of ours. And one of the members of my team, I had asked her to be our team lead. And for various reasons, she wasn't confident she could do this role, but I was, and uh, she was doing a great job. But we're, we're in this pressure cooker, right? Data pipeline down. We only had one data engineer and we had my lead. And so Friday night at around 10 o'clock and she's out of California, you know, I'm on the phone with her and this other engineer and she is very upset, very upset. And she's saying to me, I told you I couldn't do this job. I told you I couldn't do this. I'm not you know, this isn't, this isn't for me. I'm out, you know, and she was really frustrated. And I said to her, all right, what, what did I ask you to do? And she said, well, you gave me this ambiguous statement of, I want you to lead. 
And I said, okay. And is data engineering your specialty? No. I said, okay. So I, I know that too. What I needed you to do is when the chips are down and the data pipeline's down, not saying it's not my specialty, I can't do it. But as you are rolling up your sleeves and doing the database query work that we need. And we had some crazy number, 140 different joins that had to be done. And she had done over 130 of them in a matter of like nine or 10 hours, right? Just in working with us and, you know, at, you know, at that point, and some of the executives for the company had been online, like the COO, right? And so people felt pressure. So I very gently asked them, hey, I got this, go ahead and focus on something else in the business. Let me take care of this, right? And they uh, they focused on a couple other issues that, that were important to them, right? So we removed that pressure from them. And it was interesting. I I looked at the dashboard. Some of it was getting populated. We're rolling in the Saturday morning. It's not a big deal. And I said, look, what I asked you to do is what you're doing. You're giving everything you can. And the team sees that you're giving everything you can. That's what we need. I'm not worried about, I'm actually, I think, you know, the CEO is probably upset for me saying this, but I said, I'm not worried the pipeline comes up actually. And <laughs> there, was, there was this period of silence where, you know, she is looking at me in the camera, like, are you crazy? And, and I, right. Because in that moment, Kimi, where can this go? I can see it only going one of two ways, right? What do you see? in that moment, what little I've told you. We're either gonna succeed or we're not. And when we succeed, it may or may not be exactly when everybody else wants it to be, but it's doable. And our team is committed to it in part because of the way you helped her understand the power of her example. Yeah, I for me, it was either going to be a moment that was going to make the team or we would always have infighting because we would never have figured out how to solve this for me. So long term, it was more of a long term vision of will this be a defining ah. moment for us that we can take on difficult challenges? Even, you know, she was brave enough to go into this problem set with very little understanding. And as a startup, we don't have a lot of specialists. We have a lot of generalists. They're helping us do things, right? And so it's, hey, we, you know, what can you do? And I said, it'll be okay. Just having that perspective, it'll be okay. Um, and what do you think happened later that evening? Gee, I wonder. She finished the last, you know, seven or eight joins and it had everything populated by Saturday morning. And yeah, you know, I went back out to the COO and said everything was up and running. Um, so part of it is, you know, reminding her of her role and that, in fact, she was doing what I, what we had agreed to. It wasn't what I asked her to do only. It was when we were talking about the promotion of her into this role, from my point of view, we were reaching an agreement on what we, what we were going to have her do. And was she committed to that? And I was reminding her that, yeah, she was doing it all and then some. And, you know, the other engineer on the call, the data engineer, it was interesting from his point of view, it was, well, you removed the pressure. Like you had sense that it was just, we were all wound too tight and you backed it off. You gave us permission to relax and that, that helped. And then you had our back. You would go and talk to the executives and, and explain, right? And which is true, right? Uh, but it for me, it was a defining moment. And it's what do you want your team to walk away with? Do you want them to walk away that I'm just here getting paid and it's a transactional relationship that I have, or that I I'm going to be truly engaged on behalf of my customer and get this up and running? Um, that was the key for me. I think that is probably one of the reasons why you, when you and I talk, I feel there's a release of pressure because I don't have to be a long-term person. I can be a little more focused on, okay, what's going on right now? Um, because I know that you can, you will take over that 
it's practically second nature to you to say, all right, yes, we have this task. And oh, by the way, this task will be over. With any luck at all, the team will continue. And so I, I have to admit, I really relish in that, that little bit of a luxury. Um, when you have people on your team, I know that you have a tendency to be always on the lookout for a talent like just like that, that um, person, that you feel you can help them grow their capacity. So you had mentioned earlier, you said you look for people who have enough confidence to, to state contrarian positions. And, you know, you build the trust, obviously, um, and an attitude of learning. What else? If you, if you had to just name two other things that you would look for that would make a person a perfect mentee for you. Wow, and in, and they they into learning said was one part. Yeah. Um, what was the other part again? Well, I said you also mentioned that rather than trying to turn people into folks who are comfortable with airing an opposing position, you look for people who've already developed the habit of being okay with saying. Oh wow, Zimski, um, could could we chat about that? Because I I don't quite understand the logic behind what you're saying, and so they give you not just an opposing position, but they also will give you an opportunity to rethink things. So having an attitude of learning, being self confident enough to be able to say, "Oh, I don't quite understand that," or "Oh." What if we tried it this way instead? Um, what other things do you think people need to have in order to either be a perfect mentee for a senior person or to be able to groom themselves to further growth? I think you mentioned one of the important elements and you said it very nicely. They have to have a, the confidence to say, I wanna take this next step. How often, myself included earlier in my career would say, hey, you are fantastic, you need to do this role. And they, people dig in or they're not, they're not ready, right? They're not ready. And you can't, you can't make people do things um, in our space in terms of knowledge workers, right? They, they have to arrive at that and make that decision. Uh, but, you know, sometimes having caring colleagues is important. So uh, you mentioned, trust and you know how I debiased myself years ago when I worked in HP labs we had a, a rule that every engineer every employee had a silver bullet so if you're a project manager or an executive you had to do whatever the engineer said so but they only got one so as long as they're on the project they got one right but you might be in a situation where you know you can't do something and, a, and an engineer might well I want to do it this way my way and mm -hmm. you know you might argue and they're like okay I'm using my silver bullet. All right, and we would take it. So an example of this is I was in a new division and we, I was in charge of a test team. So it was my first role as a test manager. And my principal engineer said, you should hire this individual. And so I went to interview her and she was asleep underneath her desk mid morning. And at that point in my career, this was unprofessional and, uh, you know, uh, you know, she set up the meeting. I asked her to set it up and I show up and she's not ready. And I just went away. And, you know, my principal engineer said, you need, you really need to hire her. You really need to hire her. And I was like, ah, no, no, she wasn't ready. She hasn't even responded to me. Like she, no. And so that evening, as we're walking out in the parking lot, uh, John said to me, I'm pulling my silver bullet. You're hiring him. Best decision I never made. Right. <laughs> Um, because she is one of, and we're friends to this day, right? And she challenged me in so many ways and not long after we started working together, maybe two or three months, I was messing up really bad, frankly, at my job, right? New domain. Um, in addition to testing and automation, I had the build system and the build was going poorly. 
And, you know, what do you, what do you do at that point? Right. Um, I chose to go to my director and say, I'm messing up. This is how I know here are the metrics I'm tracking, some quantitative, some qualitative, but I have an answer for you. You're going to take this woman that, you know, has been with me for a couple months. You're going to promote her to be my peer and she's going to take over the build system. And I would recommend to her, she would take these engineers with her, but it'll be her call. And three, four months later, she absolutely fixed it. Did a great job. Um, and what's interesting about the story is for this individual, other people in the labs never saw her being a manager because she was contrarian. She did speak up and she didn't understand that the way she communicated sometimes turned people off. And so I was able to coach her to answer or ask questions in a way that were less threatening to people, right? Uh, especially to executives that, you know, executives tend to have an ego, right? Uh, but, you know, she was phenomenal. But she, it was a, she was in a different place. Others recognized her talent, her nascent talent and ability. And, you know, fortunately, I had a, a, a smart enough engineer that said, you don't know it all, Alan, you need to do this. And so over my career, I've seen it time and again where, you know, listening to people, and acting on that, people need to understand that you're listening as a leader and that you're actually taking action on that. And if you're not, there's a reason why, because you do have, as you said earlier, trust, right? But they've sharing been sharing that reason, right? Yes, yes. And um, yeah, and, you know, it, it, yeah. So I could tell you a story about her. I remember we were together someplace. I wanted her to backfill a role I had as a director someplace. And so she went through a very challenging interview cycle and she terminated through the middle because she felt that somebody, it was a very senior executive questioned my approach on something. So that example I gave you about the build system, they, now obviously you could present it one of two ways, right? So the way that uh, I've chosen to present that story is with some humility that, you know, I was goofing up. And I'm sure this individual knew about that story. She presents it as an opportunity to turn things around, which it was, and she did a fantastic job. And this individual challenged her and said, so what you're saying is Alan failed and you had to pick this up. And she's like, well, this interview is about me, not about that chump Alan. So let's focus on me and what I can do for you and the business. And he was a very aggressive uh, interviewer and he's like, no, answer the question. Did Alan screw up or not? And she said, the interview's done. Thank you. And she got up and she walked out. And the senior vice president I, I reported into came to me and said, you know, this individual's really good. We should make her a lead engineer. Uh, don't think she's director material. And I said, no, this is the role that I opened up. And she will fill it or I will gap it and she'll earn the seat. And, you know, the senior vice president looked at me and said, you know, if the patient dies on the table, it's on your head. And, you know, a lot of times when you're dealing with other colleagues, you know, they put this pressure on you. Right. And I felt it. And I thought about it for a second and I said, well, that was always the case. Right. Good hires, bad hires. It's always on the hiring manager, right? And uh, right. And then I reminded him of our agreement that we had always made. And this is the power of keeping these things clear. I, I said this individual, we always said that hiring people on my staff was my call. And so I'm exercising my right as a director to do that. And he said, okay. And a couple months later, he came back and he said, She's really good. And he left. That's all he ever said about it. Um, right. So, you, you know, I think. I'm surprised you even got that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of people. Well, and, you, you know, you're exactly right. A lot of executives won't. I mean, nobody wants. Who wants to admit you made a mistake or you're wrong? Right. Good. Nobody. Nobody wants to. Right. Um, and so I give him great credit for that. But. Like, er like everybody I've ever known, most people I've known, you want success. 
it starts with success for your client, you know, success for your company and team, and then yourself, right? And if if you think about it in that order, you know, you're okay. So for example, when I worked on that program for the federal government, there was a lot of confusion uh, because there were multiple agencies involved. Um, and and 1,400 pages of requirements, <laughs> really? 1,400. A lot, a lot of requirements. <laughs> A lot of people managing, you know, the team's time. There were 60 people on this team. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was talking to the program manager on the federal side that was my partner. And for whatever reason, up until my arrival, they, they hadn't fully read her in on what was going on. And I'm not sure why. I don't, I don't understand, right? It was, it was kind of like, you got to go to this system and read this document. And, um, she would join meetings and our stand-ups and, and that sort of thing. But um, I've always been an open book with these things. Like I got nothing to hide. If people want to, you know, want to crawl through and see what we're doing in engineering, I got no problem. I'll share you what we're doing, uh, what metrics we're tracking. You know, they'll ask me, well, why aren't you tracking this and this? And I'll explain where we're at on the journey, right? Where maybe we're not ready. So for example, uh, at one place I worked, I came in. They were working a Kanban. Um, so one, one place that I worked, we were starting a Kanban, but we didn't have any metrics. So we were just seeing packages work through the system, but we didn't have a sense of how long work took each work package. We did not understand defects that were coming in because of that work. Uh, fortunately, the defect volume was extremely low. So the, the team was doing a nice job in maintaining high quality, but we didn't have a system in place just to measure that and just make sure and review it that we were doing things well. And so, you know, when I first joined, they asked, well, why aren't you tracking estimates? And I said, well, we're in this particular workflow, but we're going to change the scrum, start to provide estimates, and then slowly build out our KPIs over time and, and show people where we're at. But uh, in this case with the with the federal program, she was just excited that I was an open book. I mean, she's paying me. <laughs> she's the client. So I was like more than happy to give her any information that would help the team, right? And if she saw something maybe I didn't see, we could fix it. And she was an incredible partner because she in turn had another federal agency who was her customer. And so when I came in, people thought this was a, and it was a complex environment. Don't get me wrong. It was very complex of multiple agencies, hundreds of stakeholders. But for me, it boiled down to who's my client first, who is her client next, right? Then my team, if I take care of it in that order, we'll be fine. And we were. It's context. The importance of context and communication is huge. And so you, your setting those priorities really helps folks to understand what it is that you're focused on and also gives them the context for why decisions might be made in a particular way and how they can then use those same priorities to guide their own decisions. Um, which again is is a huge empowering mechanism. So Alan, I cannot tell you how grateful I am that you took the time to do this. And I remember when I first asked you to do this, I was thinking to myself, how have I not asked Alan to do this before? What is wrong with me? Well, you, um, you know a lot of really good people. So... <laughs> I'm just honored that I was on the list somewhere. So thank you. Oh, are you kidding? So um, definitely my best to you and of course to your family. And I hope to heck at some point, we're actually going to be in the same physical room at some point in time. But in the meantime, be well, my friend. And thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. Stay awesome, Kimi. Good to see you. Take care. Take care.